Our first presentation this afternoon is by Mukta Matta Sukundeji. Mukta Ji is a qualitative researcher by profession who also takes deep interest in women's issues and animal rights, especially from a dharmic perspective. With degrees in management sciences and sociocultural anthropology, she loves to indulge in sense making from a Hindu indigenous women's perspective. Hailing from the Sindhi community and with her ancestral roots in Sindh, she deeply cares for the rights of transnational refugees and often speaks around intergenerational trauma of migration. Muktaji's presentation is entitled Erasing the Hindu of Sindh. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking time out and attending this presentation on Erasing the Hindu of Sindh. I would like to start by saying Cheti Chandaji Lakh Lakh Vadhai which means a very happy new year. Uh, Sindhis all over the world, just like other Hindu communities, celebrated the, their new year on 2nd April. My name is Mukta Mata Sakunde. I'm a consumer researcher by profession and was born and brought up in Mumbai. My grandparents came from Gujarat, from Shikarpur, Hyderabad and Larkana regions. And today my family and relatives are spread across India, Dubai and the US. This presentation today is an ode to my family and the larger Hindu Sindhi community that has been deprived of a connection with their ancestral lands. I'm going to be starting my presentation with a brief snapshot of a few key events that have been happening in Pakistan since 2020. Ganesh Temple 2021, Mehak Kumari, 15 years old, 2020. Teri Temple, Karak, December 2020. Bharti Bai, 24 years, 2019. Matarani Bhatiani Te Devi Temple, 2020. Puja Kumari, 14 years, 2019. Matarani Temple, Nagar Parkar, 2020. Mehak Keswani, 22 years. Sri Ram Mandir Badin, 2020. Manisha Kumari, 14 years, 2019. Hanuman Temple, Layari, 2020. Renuka Kumari, 20 years, August 2019. And finally, a 100 year old temple in Rawalpindi, 2020. What are these dates? Who are these women? Why am I starting my presentation with this? This is a brief snapshot of key Hindu temples that have been attacked and destroyed across Pakistan starting 2019 and 20. And the many young girls and women that have been abducted and forcibly converted to Islam. These are the more prominent cases which have been covered in media outlets. Many, many more cases go unreported for fear of life of Hindu Sindhis. The last two years especially have been hard on Hindu Sindhis of Pakistan as the COVID-19 pandemic and related travel restrictions have further increased their economic problems as well as safety concerns. As per a survey conducted by the All Pakistan Hindu Rights Movement, out of 428 places of worship at the time of partition, Today, only 20 Hindu temples are operational, while the rest have been converted for residential or commercial purposes. And many, many more remain in decaying and dilapidated conditions. Other worrying statistics also include the forcible con uh, conversion of Hindu Sindhi girls. As per Pakistan's Human Rights Commission, 20 girls are abducted and converted every month. And approximately 7,430 girls have been abducted and converted to Islam in a period of 14 years from 2004 to 2018. What you see on the right is the dreaded cleric Mia Mithu, a person who runs a conversion mafia and personally oversees conversions of abducted women in his madrasas. He is often cited as a key source of threat among families that decide to migrate or flee out of Pakistan. What is troubling 
are his close ties with the Pakistani army and the PM Imran Khan himself, allowing him, him to run these illegal and violent activities with complete impunity. It is this proximity of people like Mia Mithu to the power structure in Pakistan that makes the situation of Hindu Sindhis even more precarious. Last month, the release of the movie Kashmir Files has been a watershed moment in Indian cinema and a rather brave attempt at revisiting a violent chapter from our history. While discussing the movie uh, with my dear ones, I often heard from them that uh, at least violence against Hindu Sindhi stopped in 1947. We are doing well now. While we may have had similar experiences like those of the pundits, but we are okay now. This made me really sad. Since the Sindhi exodus never really stopped in 1947, as per various governmental surveys and human rights associations estimates, about 5,000 families, Hindu Sindhi families, continue to migrate after Pakistan every single year. The fact that people from my own community, forget the larger Hindu community, are unaware or out of touch with this reality made me feel quite sad, helpless and even desperate to bring our stories to the forefront and share our experiences of living with Hindu phobia as a minority in an Islamic state. And also understand the intergenerational trauma it has created for hundreds and thousands of Hindu families. But before we delve into that, before we get to that, I'll actually start with the story of Sindh and its rather illustrious past. What you see here is one of the most illustrious cities of ancient Indus Valley civilization, Mohenjo-daro. They say India gets her name from the Indus River, which was also called Sindhu, which itself comes from Sindh. The Indus River and its many tributaries form the Indus Basin, which spans four countries, India, China, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. The world's oldest civilization, the Indus Valley civilization, spread from Afghanistan to northwestern region in India. And archaeologists have discovered more than 1,000 cities from the Indus Valley civilization, including one of the most famous ones, the Mohenjo-daro, which was excavated in early 1900s in the Larkarna district of Sindh. Mohenjo-daro means the mound of the dead in Sindh because the city, city was built uh, from scratch seven times, one layer of, over the other uh, after floods kept submerging it every time. At its peak, Mohenjo-daro was known to be a home to a population of 50,000 people. And uh, history enthusiasts here will know how advanced and well-planned it was with various businesses and arts flourishing. Sindh also finds its reference in the Rig Ved and the Mahabharat, where the only son-in-law of the Kauravas, Jayadrat, was known to rule the Sindhu kingdom. His capital called Roruka is called Rori today and was still a major trading center even then. Finally, the land of Sindh has seen rule of more than 20 dynasties since 1300 BC and has played a great role in the subcontinent's trade, politics, and arts. While there's a lot more ground to cover on Sindh's history, I would like to directly jump to the pre partition Sindh in Western Pakistan. By several historical records and estimates, the Hindu population stood at more than 15% of the total population in Western Pakistan. Hindu Sindhis were spread across Western Pakistan and they constituted, uh, specially constituted 50% uh, of Tharparkar and Umar, Umair, Umair Kot, sorry, Umair Kot regions that you see here. And therefore, ideally should have been considered legitimate regions for partition. But History was rather unkind to Hindu Sindhis. As we now know, historical records show that Krishna Menon had submitted a proposal for the partition of Sindh and Punjab to Lord Mountbatten. It was only legitimate and fair to partition these regions and allow their ascension to India. 
However, that was not to be. As Pandit Nehru has himself shared in his autobiography, he was ne never really attracted to Sindh. In his view, he felt the Hindu communities of Punjab and Sindh were very much like Banyas and will in fact pose a trouble in peaceful negotiations. And so it happened that not only did entire Sindh region, but also almost 3,000 kilometers of the Kutch of Ran of Kutch went to Pakistan. What could have been a legitimate home for Hindu Sindhis in post-partition India continued to remain a part of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. The Hindu population very quickly dwindled from a little more than 15% in 1931 to 1.3% in 1951. Today, Hindus are the biggest minority in Pakistan, but make up less than 2% of their total population, while Hindi Sindhus constitute only 7% of the total population in Sindh. Problems for Hindu Sindhis did not end there. Post partition, the community had to put up with various overt attacks on their cultural identity and even attempts to delegitimize their language. When we talk about migration, migration of people from Pakistan to India happened across Indian cities and states. But when it comes to migration of people from India to Pakistan, these were mostly contained in Sindh. Early years after partition proved to be detrimental for Sindh's socio-economic conditions. With all-round attack on their land, their income, their language, their places of worship, state-sponsored interventions against the Sindhi language, against the state's economy, trade, education, led to really large-scale alienation and fear among Hindu Sindhis of forever losing their independent identities and ways of life. Sindhi language uh, was gradually phased out as a medium of instruction in schools and in civil offices and bureaucracy. And there was an attempt made to replace Sindhi language with that of the language of the incoming refugees, Urdu. The 60s and 70s were therefore rife with riots in colleges across Karachi, Hyderabad and other regions where libraries were burnt and Sindhi speaking population were attacked and even killed. This led to, of course, the rise of more radical and violent student and political movements to protect their right to religion, right to language, and the control over their economic activities. Over the years, many social commentators, academicians, historians have shared how Sindh contributes the most to Pakistan's economy due to Karachi's trade and progress. And yet, the indigenous people of Sindh are one of the most marginalized minorities in Pakistan. Right after partition, the central government took control of Karachi and its port, and the state of Sindh lost out on all economic benefits that came from having Karachi as a part of their territory. Recent statistics, in fact, show that almost 80% of Sindhi population lives below the poverty line and has been systematically di discriminated against in employment, education, farming, and general trade. Not just uh, employment and education, Hindu temples in Karachi and Hyderabad were quickly converted to beef shops and commercial shops and shoe shops, while publication of Hindi mag Sindhi Hindu magazines and literature also took a hit, took a hit for the worse. Here is an experience that is being shared by a Sindhi Hindu doctor who fled from Hyderabad, Pakistan in 2011. Let's hear her experience. Karachi was a hub yeah. and it was a major port. Mm. So it was the money actually, everything in Karachi. So mm. what they did, they basically slaughtered people, mm. they robbed people, they killed people, and they blackmail people and whoever was coming uh, in power, even everybody have been killed in that time in Karachi. So I remember when I was actually studying in uh, medicine mm. in Jamshoro, mm. I was being told that 
fire not to stick in the oh if you are traveling in um, in uh, from karachi to hyderabad try not to go to karachi but if you are actually going for you know in a, in any emergency requirement you try not to speak hindi try to speak urdu and because of the phonic change the people who were not aware how to change the phone they been picked up from those buses and shoot that since 1947 until today the living conditions of all minorities including that of hindu sindhis has only become more severe with covert and overt forms of bigotry hindu phobia and violence towards their way of life in 2012 fresh wave of attacks started against hindu sindhi community with the abduction and forcible conversion of rinkal kumari this case grabbed international attention then as rinkal's case also went up to the supreme court of pakistan where it went on for months despite tremendous pressure from religious clerics and from her abductors rinkal kumari maintained that she had been forcibly converted and had not married for love and she wished to stay with her own family but the extreme pressures and threats to the lives of her family members finally got to her and rinkal disappeared from public life until date most people do not know her whereabouts it was a clear signal to the hindu sindhi community to be prepared for their daughters to meet the same fate i myself found out about this ongoing migration of pakistani hindu sindhis only in 2013 when i met a sindhi family in the uk while i was studying i stayed in touch with them over the years and learned about the events that led to them fleeing their homes and seeking refuge in india uk us and elsewhere in the next few slides i've tried to bring forth voices of such displaced people their experiences of living in pakistan and the many forms of hindophobic attacks uh, that the community continued to face allow me to play a few snippets from my interviews the time was uh, 1980s i think if i'm not wrong um there was a you know the power was taken over from sindhi culture to the um, transform uh, transferred to um muhajir culture mm. have you heard about muhajir word yes so muhajir means people who uh migrating partition migrated to pakistan exactly. right urdu yes. speaking muslims urdu from india speaking. Mm -hmm. exactly those who basically came from uh india. in a partition time moved mm -hmm. from india mm -hmm. they had completely different uh, you know the uh the behavior mm -hmm. they had anger they had revenge mm -hmm. they had rage inside so mm -hmm. those rages they brought back in practice mm -hmm. not their selves but to their generation to generation you know what i mean yeah. so we as a native we also face that mm -hmm. because we were hindu right in region mm -hmm. who was actually looking to those people to give us a mercy for education because you can imagine those are in the leading power they were actually distributing i grew up in a discrimination i grew up and i actually grew up in a mindset that i will never ever uh start any discussion or try to give a uh, you know share my feelings with someone else How is, the, how is it possible to live like that from the child we have been basically brought that way I mean i remember um, i remember my father has a friend they all were muslim hmm. uh, 
but he has a limitation that these will stay outside in home only their families will come but if they come you do not discuss about any religious point if their children is raising any point saying anything to your bhagwan you just listen quietly and ignore these things that is the best way to grow otherwise they will kill you they will abduct you you will never ever actually you know grow up elder so our uh, knowledge was if they slap you give the other side but do not say why i was like crazy about armed forces like craze hota hai har insaan mein mere bhai ko bahut shock tha he even went for uh, the admission सिलेक्शन भी हो गया मतलब ये सिलेक्शन इन द सेंस कि ही वो सिलेक्टेड एज वन ऑफ द के ये बच्चा ये लड़का जो ये आगे जाएगा जब वहाँ पे सिलेक्टर्स को पता चला कि ही इज हिंदू तो उन्होंने मना कर दिया कि सॉरी हिंदूज आर नॉट अलाउड इन आर्मी वॉट इज ए रीजन हिंदूज आर दे आर इंडियंस और वो अगर आर्म फोर्सेज के साथ होंगे तो वो हमारे लीक कर देंगे इंफॉर्मेशन बिकॉज हिंदूज आर एक्चुअली स्पाई we are spy here is another clip you know what for me um living that at home you know what for me um living that at home where he lived mm. all his life I, yeah. his demise was a was in that home yeah yeah and living living that home was not easy yeah yeah um, very the murkot yeah it's it's very mm. murkot is very very dear place to me Yeah. मैं शायद सिंध मेरी रूह में है तो फिर मैं वहां से बिलोंग करती हूँ <coughs> मैं शायद दुनिया में कुछ भी बोल सकती हूँ सब कुछ बोल सकती हूँ बट मैं उस घर को नहीं बोल सकती जहाँ पे मैंने अपने बाप को देखा है आई वॉज फाइव ईयर्स ओल्ड वेन पापा पास अवे बट आई स्टिल रिमेम्बर दैट होम उसकी जो दीवारें हैं ना वो भी मुझे आज याद है खंडक बन चुका है मेरा घर I still see that home in dreams. I have about nine hours of material through the interviews that I conducted. Time and again, my participants uh, mention struggling with these experiences and attacks. They all meet some or the other definition of what we now know or call as Hindu phobia. properties being illegally captured abductions and forced disappearances rapes conversions abduction of hindu sindhi businessmen demand for ransom murders conflating the native sindhi hindu identity with that of being an indian and therefore calling them spies or traitors asking them to go back to india muted festival celebrations temples and religious practices being under attack bonded labor among the poorest of the poor dalits and these islamiyat classes spewing hatred against hindu students class calls for violence in madrasas taboo and demonizing due to alcohol shops a lot of people mentioned that all alcohol shops and liquor related misbehaviors were often blamed on hindus and there was a perception that hindus are polluting society through immoral acts not being able to wear or show any hindu signs any identity of you being a hindu most of the women i spoke to said they were never able to wear bindis or saree or payal uh, to avoid being identified as a hindu erasing identity through language 
referring to all minorities as non-Muslims or gair Musliman, gair Muslim, clubbing all identities together, erasing individual identities, and therefore also creating a sense of otherness. Government jobs and reservations for the lowest of the low profiles only, for example, sweepers. It's not easy to live un under such constant threat to one's physical, mental, emotional, spiritual well-being. Being constantly under attack often has far-reaching effects on the Sindhi Hindu community. One of my research participants mentioned her son uh, was the only Hindu boy in class and therefore was always ridiculed and bullied in school, which had led to him stammering. Now it's been a decade that they have left Pakistan and still he's not been able to overcome his condition. People I spoke to had managed to migrate out of Pakistan. They all felt they were lucky. But what happens when Hindu Sindhis do manage to escape to other countries? They have probably ensured basic survival. But what after that? Do they thrive in their new homes, their new abodes, their new nations? Let us find out. The pictures you see here are from migrants who are now living in the state of Rajasthan in India. True assimilation is always difficult. Hindu Sindhis coming to India find themselves in very uniquely difficult positions. My study participants told me that when they were in Pakistan, they were often told to go back to India. Uh, they are not natives of Pakistan. They've only shifted here after partition. So how can a Sindhi be a native of Pakistan? But now when they've crossed borders, they've come to India, they're hoping for some kind of reprieve, some kind of warmth, friendliness. They have to pass another test, the test of nationality and their true identity. Indians don't always view them as persecuted Hindus, rather as Pakistanis and therefore possible spies. When going to other countries, the Hindu Sindhi community becomes susceptible to racism, discrimination based on their skin color, problems of language, limited working knowledge of English, being forced to pay more for basic utilities, and so on. There's, of course, the problem of uh, an acute sense, rather, or loss of language and heritage that these displaced communities feel, a disconnect with the special foods and their way of life. For those of you who may have watched the Kashmir Files and recall the scene where the protagonist, Krishna Pandit, is introduced to Kashmiri cuisine for the first time, that scene will resonate with a lot of Hindu Sindhis. And in fact, every displaced and persecuted community who has had to leave behind not just their lands, but their homes, their crops, their special spices and foods. Another problem faced by most educated people who flee is the abject shortage of economic opportunities. People I met with have been doctors, specialists, gynecologists, filmmakers, media personalities who are now reduced to working as nursing staff or sales managers in small trading firms. These people could have been somebody back home. They could have made valuable contributions to their own society, their local economies, uplifted their own communities. But this right has been snatched away from them violently. And of course, there's a deep visceral need for ancestral roots and home. All displaced Hindu Sindhis are natives of Sindh. Their grandparents decided to stay back during the partition. They put up with years of sacrifice and dodged violence to stay connected to their roots. And now somehow it has come to pass that their own grandchildren are being forced to give up these very homes, these very lands and their livelihoods. Given this context of the 
larger of the sindhi hindu community there are certain larger more existential threats that face all global sindhis everywhere today not having a state to call your own comes with its own challenges young sindhis don't learn the language often can't read their literature are unaware of their past and are often uprooted and disengaged with their own identity this of course also makes them susceptible to religious conversions as their own ties with their religious ethnic cultural identities are quite weak several poor sindhis in india have long been on the radar of missionaries sindhi sindhi hindu women have been prey to coercive relationships conversions and even murders there's also a general lack of understanding in the sindhi youth about its place and sindh's place in the history of the subcontinent and the impact sindh has had on the politics of the region this cannot be right and of, of course it often also leads to misplaced calls for participation in campaigns such as anti ca bill I was shocked personally when during the end of 2019 beginning of early 2020 I saw so many well off sindhi millennials and generation z participating in anti ca campaigns anti ca protests most of them i feel i believe probably didn't even know or had been kept unaware deliberately about the struggles of their own ancestors their own grandparents and their escape from violence during the partition and now this was the community this very young uh, sindhi was now stopping entry to other persecuted sindhis and hindus from elsewhere talk about self goals does hindu phobia violence and forced migration have had a much deeper and adverse impact on the very roots of the sindhu sindhi hindu identity having understood the plight of hindi uh, hindu sindhis and the large scale acts of violence against the community uh, one would imagine or certainly hope that these incidents get sufficiently covered in the media in this section i'll show data backed evidence on how the pains and the injustices inflicted on the hindu sindhis are systematically questioned doubted glossed over and erased by the media I have taken the case study of Pooja Kumari. While working on the final draft of this presentation in the last week of March, the sad news of a teenage girl, Pooja Kumari, and her murder in Sindh sent shock waves in the subcontinent. Pooja Kumari was alone at home when her murderer possibly entered her house and tried to abduct her with the intention of converting her. She dared to resist. and had to pay for it with her life she was shot at point blank by wahid lashari and a few other accomplices and her body was left on the streets it pained me to write this presentation when i could see and read such news almost on a daily basis i'm taking this as a live example as a case study uh, as we were able to pull out live data for how social media various news and media outlets and human rights activists covered this case let me walk you through some of my findings i should start by sharing credit with my data scientist friend who wouldn't be li- who wouldn't like to be named here but he did help me quite a bit to pull out streams of data on this case let's understand if pooja pooja's case actually made it to the us and world media now this data set consists of about 26 news articles that we came across the time frame that we took was march 20 2022 to march 25 2022 pooja was uh, shot dead on march 21 we used google news api to uh, source sample of articles by using relevant keywords what i found was that india had contributed as much as 50% of the total articles on this issue as against pakistan and the rest of the world combined 
we also when we analyze the top 10 keywords appearing in most of these articles we realize that abduction marriage marry came up more frequently than hindu conversion or minority what i did next was uh, a google, normal google search using pooja kumari sindh and pakistan as my keywords and pardon this very rudimentary method but this is what i got on my google search these are all the major uh, news outlets in india that covered this story when i did a cursory check on the titles of all the news articles they were a study in themselves the textual analysis of titles of these articles confirmed what our previous slide told us almost all articles mention man who killed hindu girl wanted to marry her if people were only to skim the headlines of newspapers they would be left thinking that it was probably a case of a spurned lover or a lover's quarrel gone horribly wrong i began to pull out more news articles from major indian english newspapers and do note that by this time the killer had already been caught and he had admitted to his crime the tribune the first screenshot is from the tribune which says the man actually wanted to marry the hindu girl of course only once he converted her look at the focus on marriage look at how ndtv has covered this case man suspected of killing park hindu girl who turned down his marriage proposal making the news about uh, it being a rejection of the man and his proposal rather than an attempt at forced conversion the wire too went down the same route only a little worse they said pooja kumari was murdered allegedly by a muslim man in pakistan sin province by refusing to marry him for refusing to marry him now you see when media outlets scream headlines like this they gloss over the atrocities meted out to hindu sindhi girls and in fact uh are lead to erasure in fact lead to erasure of uh, these crimes and the existence of these women i came across a post by uh, she the people which is a well known media outlet here in india and caters to women readers uh she the people went crazy overboard using allegedly in their really tiny article if you can read here in the sukhur area of sindh pakistan a hindu woman was allegedly murdered after declining a marriage proposal according to reports wahid lashari the accused planned to marry the woman 18 after allegedly converting her to islam look at all these statements were allegedly forced allegedly kill her was allegedly shot all of this despite knowing that the man the suspect had actually been arrested and admitted who he admitted to his crime so when media outlets continue to use words like allegedly what do they want to do they want us to believe that there is no anti hindu violence they raise questions on the veracity of such incidents did violence occur at all you can use allegedly when a person's guilt has yet not been proven but how can you continue to use allegedly for someone who's been clearly murdered and there is videographic evidence for it next uh, quite honestly uh, this is some honest coverage on the issue and i was frankly not expecting it on the left you will see robert spencer's blog calling out the violence and on the right you will see the print saying it as it is Now many of us know Robert Spencer to be a right-wing Islamophobe but isn't it surprising and rather sad to find out that uh, support is coming from a right-wing Islamophobe on the Hindu cause even if it is to fulfill his own purpose and narrative than from people in the media or activists on the left who always claim to speak for injustices around Let us look at what happened when prominent Hindu Sindhi activists and social media influencers in Pakistan raised this issue. 
Kapil Dev is a Sindhi Hindu activist and is regularly quoted by independent Pakistani media and international media on causes related to Sindhi minorities. He put out a tweet. He said 18-year-old Hindu girl Pooja was shot dead in Rohri in a failed attempt to kidnap her. This is how you treat your minorities and then blame us when we paint bad image by highlighting these issues. I picked up some of the top responses his tweet was able to gather. This response here says that the inc incident is of course condemned by the whole nation and everyone is grieved. It may be the first or rare incident in which a girl belongs to a minority is murdered. But we have witnessed so many other such incidents among Muslim girls and against Muslim girls itself. So clearly no big thing. It happens with everyone. My pain is probably bigger than your pain because this is happening to all Muslim girls too. Other set of responses was, of course, about do not play the minority card. This happens with everyone. Sorry for your loss, but move on. Don't play the minority or the Hindu card. Yet another response on minorities are suffering in India and Pakistan. There, there. If it's any consolation, we Muslims are also suffering in India, right? I was repeatedly told by many of my participants that uh, their friends, often their friends and colleagues or neighbors would even bring up the state of Muslims in India when they heard about, let's say, the Supreme Court's Babri Masjid rulings or uh, about any cow smuggling related murders and often make Hindu phobia in Pakistan a response and retaliation to what was happening to Muslims in India. And finally, the last response really takes a kick, placing the whole and sole responsibility of ensuring their safety on the Sindhi Hindu community themselves. How did they conclude it was a crime? The person asks couple, do they have proof of such crimes against Hindu minorities? Have they ever registered FIRs? And if they have not registered FIRs, why not? Sorat Sindhu is a doctor living in Pakistan. She has about 50,000 people following her on Twitter. When she called out that Pooja met with this fate only because she was a Hindu, the responses she received showed excellent examples in gaslighting and victim blaming. In their comments, people asked her if Sindhis had given up, if Sindhis lacked courage, if Sindhis had in fact elected the right politicians, or that the central government and Imran Khan were not to blame. This fate had befallen Sindhis for their own political mistakes and voting patterns. Now, if you see Sindhu nowhere in her tweet, uh, she's not assigned any political blame. But most responses that she received alluded to the Sindhi community making poor political choices and therefore in some way also being responsible for this tragedy. Both these examples of Kapil Dev and Sorat Sindhu match with what we know about Hinduphobia outright denying or accusing Hindus or any other people of inventing or exaggerating the persecution of Hindus, including genocide. This is yet other in independent journalist in Pakistan who put out a tweet. Within the same week, right after Pooja Kumari was killed, there were three other incidents of women being attacked, women being forcibly abducted and converted. The attack on Hindu girls and women is indeed relentless. From the time my paper was ex uh, accepted in December 2021 till the time of writing this presentation in the last week of March, I have personally come across about 30 reported cases of serial abductions, rapes and murders of Hindu women in Sindh. Of course, as per Pakistan's own Human Rights Commission, roughly 20 women are forcibly converted and married off to their abductors in Sindh. Doing research in Pooja Kumari's death uh, uh, in real time was a painful exercise in learning how media creates narratives by willfully choosing to repeat or drop certain keywords and gloss over violence. Beyond Pooja's case, I also looked at key threats that the Hindi Sindhu, Hindu 
Sindhis of Pakistan face today. These include enforced disappearances or abductions, bonded labor among the poorest of Sindhis, and of course, forced conversions. For the purpose of this presentation, I have taken the case of forced conversions and also pulled out some data on the subject. I'll now quickly walk you through the same in the next few slides. Now, this data set here consists of about 253 news articles available online. We again use the Google News API to source a sample of news articles related to our topic uh, using key search terms on religious conversions and Pakistan. For each country, a country label was also assigned based on the headquarter location of the respective publication. We've taken a period of 10 years, starting from Jan 2012 to March 23, 2022. Based on a sample of 253 relevant articles, uh, Indian media constitutes about half the news on forced conversions, around the same as Pakistan and the rest of the world. What we found interesting was church-related organizations also cover and contribute about 5% of these articles. Probably they're interested in knowing and tracking if they've achieved their annual targets. Uh, what's interesting here also is how a blanket term minority is used to club all conversions, but we rarely see the word Hindu being brought up. Uh, Hindus are the biggest minorities uh, in Pakistan, uh, but the word Hindu is often not used in such coverage. Uh, though the coverage by Western media is quite uh, honestly quite less, uh, but I realize there is some progress being made. A small positive trend for me also was uh, when I kept seeing uh, the mention of bill or anti-forced conversion bill in all coverage by, West, by Pakistani media, in fact. This bill was rejected by the Parliamentary Committee in Pakistan in October 2021, stating that such a bill would adversely impact the law and order of the country and would make the minorities more vulnerable. While this rejection was deplorable, but the growing initiative by some Pakistani media outlets to constantly apprise the public and shape their opinion is indeed commendable. Here is a look at the key uh, news outlets that uh, keep covering these news in Pakistan and outside Pakistan. So Dawn, as you can see, uh, their coverage of anti-forced conversion bill and pushing for legal reforms is quite commendable. And having said all of this, it would still have been a lot more effective uh, if they had used the word Hindu in their coverage or Hindu Marriage Act in the state of Sindh, which exists only on paper. But some progress is still good. Next, I also looked at some what we call torch bearers of human rights and uh, their coverage on this issue. Here is a screenshot of a 2021 report uh, on Pakistan released by the Human Rights Watch. It's a fairly long article, which you can find on their website. And the topics are covered on the left-hand side. So these three topics, actually, freedom of religion and belief, abuses against women and girls and children's rights. These were my topics of interest. I guess that this is where I would likely find the problem of forced conversions. While I didn't actually find anything on Hindu Sindhis under freedom of religion and belief and children's rights, the abuses against women and girls tab threw up some interesting findings. So I actually went through the entire section and right here at the bottom of the article, you can see uh, in a paragraph, the report mentions uh, women from religious minority communities remain particularly vulnerable to forced marriages. Now, essentially what um, Human Rights Watch was trying to do here is club all minorities of Pakistan together. And sure, why not? We have enough and more evidence of all minorities facing violations and discrimination. But when you actually click on this forced marriage link, it opens up a 2019 article by the Tribune, which you can see on the right. 
which is wholly focused on forced conversions, abductions, and violence experienced by the Hindu girls and women from Sindh. So, basis this article about twenty Hindu girls, which I mentioned earlier in my presentation, twenty Hindu girls are kidnapped every month, and these are just the reported cases. Why I think it is worth to mention this example is that international organizations and media outlets will often find newer ways to erase the pains of the Hindu community wherever they are in a minority. All that the Human Rights Watch had to do was mention Hindu or Sindhi or Sindh in their report, but they willfully decided to erase these words from their report. Here is a positive example, which is a welcome change. I feel after years of being tweeted at and tagged, uh, Amnesty International for the first time took up the cause of Hindu community in 2020, especially after the news of rising temple attacks began capturing global attention. Having said this, I also looked for uh, coverage and advocacy by the UN Watch, uh, UN Human Rights Commission. the equality labs especially the equality labs as they claim to stand for all dalit clauses in south uh, sorry all dalit causes in south asia going through their twitter handles and website i was unable to find any coverage on hindu sindhis or dalit sindhis in pakistan or the dire problems of violence against bonded labor and religious conversions that uh, hindu sindhis in pakistan face uh while well, the marginalization of minority sindhus has of course gained a lot of traction attention in pakistan and in the west in the last few years uh several social commentators and academicians have decoded this decoded this phenomena in their own ways uh where they'll try and assign blame elsewhere uh if you can see there are several push and pull factors push factors of course include love marriages free will agency of women widow marriages uh, in hinduism are discouraged desire to leave a casteist form of hierarchy desire to leave untouchability behind socio economic incentives that come with being a muslim in an islamic republic and pull factors are of course charismatic clerics egalitarian teachings of islam widow remarriage is possible in islam equality of status in class and caste on the right you can also see coverage by the new york times on this issue where they've called out poverty and desperation as the reason for conversion in pakistan while some of this may be true poverty does lead people to convert in some cases to be able to get more state benefits but there's a clear cut attempt to build a general public opinion that most conversions happen either out of free will or out of the individual's interest in leaving behind hinduism for all its ills or for purely economic reasons and to enjoy the benefits that come from being a muslim in an islamic state here is another example of a think piece that was published in uh, al jazeera which goes to great lens to draw parallels between brahmanical patriarchy and sayyidism according to the writer caste based violence in pakistan is in itself an import of the hindutva ideology right from across the border all in all one can see some pockets of change mostly led by individual independent journalists media houses social media activists but by and large in the mainstream media in western media global media uh, international human rights organizations still a lot needs to be done they need to grow a spine and present an authentic picture of hindu phobia and violence that is being faced by hindu sindhis of pakistan we are right at the end of my presentation uh my intention today was to present the Sindhi Hindu story give a voice to an otherwise heavily marginalized and persecuted community uh being uprooted from one's ancestral land can lead to multi generational trauma which is often difficult to overcome my only request to everyone who's 
attended my presentation today is simple speak up when you see per- persecution uh help to give a voice to people who can't speak for themselves raise these issues in your letters to the editors with your local government representatives and definitely call out media outlets when you see inauthentic reportage and blatant erasure and today if you are a sindhi elder or a young sindhi attending my presentation my appeal to you is that you share your stories within your families with your children among your friends so that the young are able to learn appreciate and reconnect with their illustrious roots and historical persecution so that they do not end up on the wrong side of history they learn to protect people like their own people like their ancestors uh who also had to flee from such persecution we all in these will have to learn to help ourselves like we've learned in school god also helps those who help themselves jay julela thank you for attending my presentation For the latest on our YouTube channel, click subscribe and hit the bell icon for alerts on new content. Remember to like, comment and share our videos. For more about HSC, you can visit the social media handles listed below.